Right. Good afternoon. Last talk of the day in this uh, in this session, this HF stream, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce John G4 IRN, who I've known for a number of years. Uh, John and I have contest contested together in West Africa. Uh, he has a lot of experience of both contesting and DXing. Um, but the talk he's going to give us today is a little bit different. I'm certainly looking forward to it because this one I know is, uh, it's one of those rare ones and it's one of those that you would normally only do as a group. And um, John's not silly, so this was going to be one that he would do as a group. Um, <laughs> what what uh, absolutely astonishes me is that he pulled off an absolutely fabulous uh, operation single-handedly in the end for reasons which I'm sure he will share with us. So, John, I think the best thing is to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Don. <laughs> okay, I've got to stand in this square. Um, so if I stray, please, please shout. It's all for the video, I believe. Um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming along. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, good, okay. I'm not really used to speaking into a microphone, as many of you know. And in fact, it occurred to me on the way here I've never ever in my life said Victor Uniform for golf, but I have now. Um, that's what this the expedition is about. So as Don alluded to, um, this was originally going to be a group effort. Thanks for giving away the punchline. <laughs> 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 but um, it was uh, round about um, April last year that I thought, right, time to do the expedition. Um, and... Um, of course, I looked down the, the, the most wanted list. Generally, I would look at the top 100 and think, well, where am I going to get pilots? And um, at this stage in the sunspot cycle, I thought, well, the Pacific is probably not a good place to go to. So I started looking at uh, Africa and um, Indian Ocean. Uh, Africa, <coughs> uh, to the, the rare countries are difficult to get to uh, and, and or dangerous. Um, and I thought, well, what about VU4 or VU7? And traditionally, it's been very, very difficult to get licenses there. They're um, in the kind of 50s, or were in the 50s, in terms of uh, most wanted out of the, um, the, the DHCC list. So I thought, right, well, uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Let's, let's try and uh, see if we can get there. So it was actually at the, the Scottish GMDX convention last um, April, I think it was, that um, I floated the idea and um, I had two people immediately say, yep, I want to be there. Um, to save their embarrassment, I won't say who they were, but um, they're <coughs> good friends of mine and uh, certainly one of them I've, I've travelled with a lot before and um, a a actually um, it would have been great if they'd ultimately come along, but they, they, they couldn't. But um, the team of three was quickly formed and then uh, uh, I contacted VU2PTT, who's a, a well-known um, DX, DXer, contester, uh, CW operator in Bangalore. And he said, yeah, I'd love to be involved in this project. I, I, I didn't know Prasad beforehand, but he was mo most welcoming to the idea. And um, it created the team of four. So this was in April uh, last year. The D expedition incidentally took place in February, March this year. So we're about um, 10 months in, in advance at, at this point. So um, Prasad VU2PTT um, gave quite positive indications that the license for at this stage VU7 or VU4 should be possible, um, despite it being quite rare and um, not many Europeans having been there, especially. Um, so we pressed ahead. So, a bit of geography. Um, Andaman and Nicobar Islands off the coast of Myanmar and Thailand. In the red box there. The actual way to get there is... Uh, you can fly direct from India. There's lots of budget airlines go there. Um, it's a popular honeymoon destination. So plenty of uh, flights out there. And if we, if we zoom in, there's, um, I think, 570 islands in the Andaman and Nicobar group. The, uh, I haven't got a pointer here. Can I use my mouse, perhaps? No, 
haven't got a, a pointer. So um, Port Blair is the administrative capital of um, Andaman Islands. Of course, the, the British had a, a huge influence on um, India, uh, although the Japanese were um, in the Andaman Islands during World War II. Sentinel Island, which you can see to the left of um, Port Blair, is famous for its indigenous um, tribes that are protected from uh, visitors. It's Ill illegal for anyone to go to Sentinel Island. There's a, there's a bunch of uh, tribesmen, if you look it up on, on YouTube, you see them with their spears filmed from a distance, uh, and they've been completely un untouched for, for generations. So Sentinel Island is quite interesting. That's on, on YouTube, you can look that up. But of course, the, um, the Andaman Islands probably um, came into the news and certainly came um, to my awareness in 2004 when the tsunami hit. And I remember waking up on Boxing Day and seeing the news and the, the devastation. Uh, there was uh, 2,000 people killed, 4,000 people um, well, 4,000 children orphaned and 40,000 people made homeless. So that was, what, 14 years ago. And I was still to see when I visited some of the damage that that did, amazingly enough. There's some very beautiful islands um, around, and again, I've, I've seen these on um, YouTube uh, and, and, and so on, some very, very nice beaches. And lots of iotas to go at, I would have thought. So yeah, just the, the 2004 thing. Um, there was actually a de-expedition in the Andaman Islands going on when the tsunami hit in um, 2004. Um, it was an effort led by the, um, I think they're called the N NIAR, uh, National Indian Institute of Amateur Radio in India. Thanks, yeah, NIAR. Um, led by VU2RBI, and there, there, there was a group of people in um, Port Blair at the time who ended up providing emergency communications. And that was one of the first the expeditions for a while, and I think a lot of hope was put uh, subsequent to that 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 would open the doors for amateur radio. And it, and it did uh, a, a little bit. If we look at the activity from VU4, um, that 2004 effort, six-person teams for you for RBI, they made, um, what, about 8,000 contacts? I guess it was curtailed. Um, but following that, two years later, there was a big effort, uh, 10 people, VU4AM, um, 22 and a half, 23,000, and um, there's been a few since. The, um, the, uh, the expedition immediately preceding mine was at the end of last year, uh, 2017, and that was uh, Nan V1YC, James, and VU2CDP, um, Deepak, who made about, uh, well, just shy of 5,000 contacts. So um, I realized, I think it was number 57 in the most wanted. Actually, VU, VU4 and Lachadweep Lach Islands, VU7, which was my other option, um, were both about 55. 56 in the most wanted list at the point of um, thinking about this. So pileups were guaranteed. And at this stage also, we started talking about provisional operating dates, and we targeted the February, March 2018 as the, as the um, preferred operating dates, and preferably over two weekends as well so that we could maximize the, the number of QSOs because the bands tend to be busier at, at, at weekends. So we knew that there'd be quite a lengthy license application process and Prasad VU2PTT advised what <coughs> that would be. So first things first, we had to get tourist visas. Now this is fairly straightforward. There's a bit of paperwork to be done. Uh, I uh, actually applied online myself. It was one year tourist visa. I had to go to the um, office um, in, uh, the in, I think it was the Indian consular office in Hounslow that I went to and had an interview there. But for cash and a photograph and loads of forms, you can get a tourist visa. 
so uh, myself and the two Scots guys, uh, Gavin and, and Robbie, we all did that. Um, there's then uh, an Indian reciprocal license to apply for, which again is fairly straightforward, but just th there's a few hoops to get through. So um, in, in submitting the license application, there's the, the, the visa, a copy of your UK amateur license, five copies of uh, one form, four copies of another form, two um, very um, strange sized photographs. They weren't normal passport sized, it was, it was a weird size, which I, I initially had a bit of difficulty with. Um, but you need to submit all that to, uh, I, I posted it and then had the, in my case, the interview in Hounslow um, a few weeks later. And then eventually um, I got my visa, as did the other guys, Gavin and, and Robbie. Now, um, in India, reciprocal licenses begin VU3. Uh, and I was ultimately issued with VU3VXO. Now, once you've got the Indian license, you then have to apply for a change of address for your either VU4 or VU7 um, um, location. In fact, that's the, s that's the same anywhere in India. If the, the license is associated with the address that you operate at, so if you want to operate from a different address, be it Andaman or be it Lakshadweep or be it Mumbai or anywhere else, you have to get this change of address. Now, um, once we'd submitted the license application, we were still thinking um, we'd like to go to VU4 or VU7, either would do us. Um, later on, I think it was in October, there was a de-expedition VU7T, uh, and there was three or four Indian guys, plus, um, I, I don't know if he's English or American, and there was an A A45 guy, certainly a Western white guy, um, who was in on that group to VU7T, and he got refused entry on the basis that he was not Indian. So at that point, and I, f I forget where it was in, in the, the kind of timeline, um, we thought, right, we'll cross VU7 off the list and we'll go to VU4. So we started thinking about VU4. The group that had been in um, there in December, uh, James Nadi 1YC and uh, Deepak VU2CDP, um, were able to give us some information about where they'd stayed. It wasn't necessarily our first choice, um, but it's on the left coast of the main island. So um, Port Blair is um, top, top right on the map. And the, the QTH where they stayed, and we ultimately stayed ourselves, Wandor Beach over on the left. Now, to give a sense of scale, um, the taxi drive um, was about a bit less than an hour. So I suppose about 30 miles, something like that, across the island. Incidentally, all that water in the middle of the island um, that comes around the road there, that wasn't there before the tsunami. That, that area was flooded um, after the tsunami. We, we did talk about going to one of the outlying islands where we'd have um, a clear northerly, uh, well, east through west, uh, east to west through north, um, vista, but um, it, it we could have done it, but we would have had to add a couple of days to the de-expedition, extra sea traveling and so on. So in the end, we settled for this. Now, uh, looking at this on a great circle map, you can see here, so to the left is all uh, short, short path and in the clear, hence the little C logo. <laughs> and on the right was palm trees, hence the little palm trees logo. Now, radio waves don't pass through palm trees, uh, trees very well. So, um, but, but this was the, um, the, the vista that, uh, from the Google Earth perspective, we would have from the uh, resort at Wandor Beach. And you can see here, great um, shot to Europe and Africa and South America. Um, but North America was going to prove more challenging. It's on the long path. Um, or at least there's no, there's no short path, um, clear view to it. So uh, the only clear path is on the long path, and even that is to only to W6. So this was always going to be very, very difficult to North America. 
but hopefully plenty of pilots from Europe and South America. So um, we were a team of four um, after we um, had agreed to all join in and the license applications were in. Um, we'd realized that VU7 wasn't possible, so we were going to head to this location in VU4. So we started planning um, the logistics. How do we get there? What do we take along in terms of equipment and so on? And we, we were planning a, a good low band effort. And of course, um, Google Earth is your friend. We were able to look at the resort from, um, from the satellite view on Google Earth. Now, uh, you can see here, the um, uh, this was the reception, I think, or the reception to the, to the hotel was around here. Um, there was some accommodation blocks here, swimming pool. Um, these were all um, accommodation units, um, sort of uh, bedrooms in, in wooden shacks. This here, was a, a or is a conference room, and the the previous guys who'd been there in December had used that as their shack, and we thought, great, well, we'll book the shack, um, we'll book that as the shack, the conference room, and of course on Google Earth we were able to measure the the coax distance from the shack to the water's edge because we wanted the antennas at the water's edge, ob ob obviously for the improved propagation that that, that, that brings. So we started planning around each antenna being um, 65 meters away. Of course, you, you, you have to take spares, but that was the, the ballpark. Um, we, the four of us were going to take three stations, um, including 20-meter spider poles for, for LF so that we could be operating through the night on 160 and, and 80 and 40 and, and um, join the day on the higher bands. And we had it all planned out in our minds, antennas on the beach operating from this uh, conference room. Um, where we, we were probably around July at this time, maybe August when we were thinking this. So in terms of the timeline, um, oh, it was probably later than I thought. Um, it was in June that we all had our licenses. Bear in mind, um, by this time we'd said, right, definitely 21st of February, that's when we're going to go. And um, the, a couple of the other guys had, and myself actually had booked time off work so that we could go on these dates. Uh, we all had visas, the three Brits, um, by 6th of June. The, um, we all filled in the paperwork. Uh, these seem quite long periods between June and September, but you know we all had holidays and work commitments and family things going on, and and uh, draft copies of forms going to and fro being checked by Prasad to make sure that they contained all the information that we needed. Um, so ultimately, we we got the license applications in, and they were paid for um, in September on the 18th. The licenses, the VU licenses, the mainland licenses, were issued on the 7th of November, but got lost in the post. Now, um, it was around this time I started feeling a little bit nervous, because with only, um, well, from, from November, kind of three months to go, three, four months to go, I was thinking, is this going to happen or not? I, I really didn't know. I, sh I should have said, it was in um, June that one of the guys dropped out, Robbie dropped out. So by, by this time, although we still applied for four licenses, we were a team of three. Um, ultimately, the licenses arrived. Uh, they got lost in the post. Prasad had to chase, and they, they got resent. And uh, that was just before Christmas, so nothing happened over Christmas and New Year, really. But... Um, uh, we put the application in for the change of address to the Andaman Islands, and we were told that to do that, you need to have a reservation um, at the destination address so that the license can be tied in with it. Um, so we made our first, still having no license to operate in the Andaman, we made our first um, hotel reservations, and we, we, we booked flights as well because we knew that um, they would be getting more expensive nearer to departure time. So it was a leap of faith, um, and it was just after we'd booked the, <laughs> the flights <laughs> that um, two of the other guys dropped out. They got some of their money back. Um, so by January the 5th, um, three of the team of four had dropped out, and I was on my own. 
And um, Prasad was saying, oh, don't worry, you know, we'll do it next year. And I said, no, Prasad, I'm going on my own. And he said, oh, okay, um, fine, I'll, I'll support you, he said. Um, so uh, I, we actually got the change of address permission. It was still for three people. Um, and we applied for the special call of VU4G at the same time. And that was received on January the 16th. So just about a month before departure date. However, there was a bit of a, um, a sting in the tail that al although um, we'd received the permission, or by that time I'd received the permission to operate, there was um, a clause on the um, permission that I hadn't anticipated. And uh, I don't know if you can read that, but, but basically at the top here, this is the permission to operate at the um, sea princess beach resort in andaman islands with the special call vu4g and then at the bottom it says this permission is granted subject to the clearance from local authorities and i didn't have that at that time so with four weeks to go it was a scramble um, to get this permission from local authorities now fortunately i had a couple of good guys vu2 ptt and uh, vu2 cdp um, on the ground chasing this for me. And, and actually, um, DPAT VU2 CDP, who'd, who'd been here the previous December, kind of knew who to speak to, um, or he thought he, he, he did. Um, so there was lots of emails and phone calls and faxes going on on my behalf. Um, this, uh, if you note, this um, VU4 permission is granted to the, the, the team of three that survived. Um, up until just before the application went in, which is VU2PTT, uh, myself and Gavin, um, GM0GAV. Now, it's a fact that no um, foreigner has operated from VU4 alone without an Indian host or um, someone accompanying them since 1949. And that was Jim Smith, uh, VK9NS. Um, and Martin ZAY looked this up for me, by the way. But um, no un un um, unaccompanied foreigner had operated from here since 1949. And here I was, planning to go there on my own. Um, however, this permission did have an Indian national on it. Um, and I think that may have helped, even though it never went. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> so with um, with a month or so to, to go, going from a team of four to um, a team of one completely changes the logistics. Um, you know, on these trips, you always want to take spare kit, uh, spare transceivers, uh, power packs, laptop, whatever, um, and, and lots of you know tools and soldering iron and, and all that. When it when it comes down to one person, it's somewhat more difficult. Um, because of the weight, obviously, and the number of bags and so on. Um, now, the first thing that struck me was going back to the, the Google Earth um, vision. There was no way on my own I could afford the conference room. Um, and the nearest room to um, the beach is, um, is, is, is here. <coughs> yeah, so um, had to, in fact, Prasad did it on my behalf, contacted the hotel, um, cancelled the reservation on the conference room and reserved that end room, saying it's very important that we have the end room, hope you understand, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that was done. It was still a, an uncertainty in my mind because I didn't know whether actually I'd get that room or not. Um, we were originally planning to take um, LF antennas uh, in terms of you know 20 meter spider poles and all this kind of thing. Immediately those um, plans were reduced to uh, me deciding to concentrate on 40 through to 17 or 15. Um, what I decided to do was take a fairly multi-purpose antenna, or aerial I should say, and um, the aerial I took with me in the end was um, a multi-band uh, ground plane, wire ground plane with two radials, uh, elevated radials. So this was in February in the snow in my back garden at home in Surrey. And you can see here, I was resonating the radials um, as if they were a, a dipole. Uh, and the jumpers here made out of Anderson power pole connectors 
um, are to resonate it on each band. So there was, um, uh, how many were there? Seven, six or seven of these jumpers to cover 10 through 40 meters. And it was the same on the vertical element um, that um, I later resonated against these um, radials. Um, and that's what I took with me, with a, a 12 meter spider pole. So the idea was that I'd have the 12 meter spider pole on the beach and um, I would fasten with cable ties or whatever um, the ground plane with two elevated radials to, to the pole and whenever I wanted to change band I'd have to run outside, probably lower the pole, change the jumpers and put the pole back up. So um, what I had noticed incidentally from, from pictures that I'd received from the previous group, I saw some palm trees overhanging the beach. So I thought that might enter, that might give me some possibilities as well. So I took some rope and a, a pulley, just in case. So um, where were we? We were in February by this time. The, the planned departure date was the 21st of February this year. I uh, had the license in hand, my VU3 VXO, had the permission to operate from central government in VU4, but no local permission. Um, <laughs> so the, the flight connections were such that I'd have to stop over in Bangalore. And Prasad, the guy who'd been dealing with the license application, VU2 PTT, had kindly said that I could stay at his house. Um, except, that is, a um, few days before departure, his wife was hosp hospitalized um, quite ill, although she's now okay, I believe. Um, and he could no longer put me up. So um, just a few days before departure, I was like, oh, no, I've got to find a hotel in Bangalore as well. Um, however, it all came good. And um, one of Prasad's pals um, put, put me up. So um, And he was able to meet me at the airport as well. So that was sorted out. But I did um, leave home with uh, no license, um, unsh unsure about where I was going to stay in Bangalore, um, no confirmation that um, I had the beachside room in um, the resort, and, and hoping that a taxi would pick me up when I arrived in Port Blair, but not quite sure because I hadn't had the confirmation. Uh, it was quite a stressful time, this. <laughs> Did you do this for pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> it's a hobby, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so there we are at Terminal 5, uh, just h hiding the high blood pressure, um, but ready to go. So the ski bag had um, the, um, the pole, 12 meter pole, it had the wire ground plane. Um, I ended up taking 120, probably 140 or 150 meters of coax, the SL7. Um, to, to um, cover that distance that I measured plus a bit more. Um, I took uh, an ICOM 7300 as the main radio. I took a spare radio, the K2. I took two power supplies, um, a linear amplifier, Expert 1.3K, didn't have a spare. Um, uh, so yeah, all loaded up and ready to go. I think there was about 65 kilos in, in total, something like that. Um, I'd booked premium economy, so I was allowed two two bag allowance, and uh, so I didn't have to pay any ex any extra baggage on this British Airways flight to Bangalore. Um, so, um, I arrived in Bangalore. It's about half five in the morning, and it was um, Prasad's pal, uh, VU two CPL who actually picked me up. And um, it worked out really, really well. Um, he's, he's a big uh, 160, 80 meter person, has been doing, a people might recognize his call sign, been doing a lot on um, F FT8 um, recently on 8TRC. But um, has this lovely house. Uh, he's, a, he's a pilot for um, Jet Air or one of those air Indian airlines, flies the Middle Eastern routes. Got this lovely house on um, a gated estate with security. Um, there's a, a four or five star hotel on the estate um, with a health club and restaurant, all very, very nice. And um, not what I'd expected from India at all. 
They, um, the family, his wife, is, uh, works for Shell. They've got a couple of kids in private school. They've got four staff, um, a driver, uh, a cook, a cleaner, uh, a nanny. And these are kind of um, you know, middle uh, management professionals, if you like. And the standard of living was incredible, absolutely incredible. But this was, the, um, this was the start of what, for the next 10 days, was to be my Indian experience. And although I, um, I managed a, a few hours sleep um, after arrival, um, had some breakfast after that, and, and that's when the curry started. So even for breakfast, you have um, curried egg with um, curried vegetables and uh, chapati and, and, and every meal after that for the next 10, 10 11 days, whatever, was, was curry in some respect. Now, I like curry, but it was just a bit too much. Um, yeah, wha what he's got there is a uh, hex beam. And, and obviously, actually, when I was there, this was an opportunity to um, get on the air with VU3VXO, my Indian call sign. So he's got a, a hex beam um, fairly high up there. Um, there's also, you can't see it, but there's a, a, an 18 meter spider pole with some elevated radials for 160 and, and 80, I think, which he uses on LF, and he's got a beverage out as well. Um, so it's, it's not a bad setup, actually. <laughs> Terrible lawn, yeah. yeah. I think you'd live with that. Um, and before I departed, so um, I spent uh, what felt like two nights, but it was only one night because I had two sleeps. Um, I departed on the 23rd of February to um, Port Blair. Um, but before I departed, Prasad came over. Um, he'd been looking after his wife who'd fallen ill, um, but he came over. So um, this was an opportunity for us to meet up for the first time. So in this picture here, we have um, myself, VU3VXO, um, Manaj, VU2CPL, and Prasad, VU2PTT, who's always active in Beru. Many of you may know his, um, his call sign, and um, I know, Don, you're going to be operating with him in CQ Worldwide. So uh, this was the 23rd of, of February. Still no VU4 local permission, um, but... Uh, oh, wrong button. Excuse me. <laughs> there we go. Um, but just to prove I was there, there's a selfie of me at Port Blair, Port Blair Airport. Um, I arrived. And, and actually, it was um, that morning that I departed to um, Port Blair that the um, local sanction arrived. And this was it. It was purely an email from, believe it or not, the immigration officer um, at Port Blair that basically said, please ensure that no other activities um, other than tourism is permitted without MHA, whoever that is, clearance, since ham is a hobby and recreational activity is per permitted to visit these islands which doesn't quite say permitted to operate amateur radio, but um, it was good enough for me. <laughs> and, and, a and actually, um, James Navi1YC sa said to me beforehand, expect a visit from the police while you're there. Um, so I was kind of waiting for that. Um, so anyway, arrived in Port Blair, and um, the taxi was there to take me to the resort, and um, sure enough, I had the end bungalow um, next to the beach. Brilliant, just what I was hoping for. Um, so I had, them, I had my permission, the taxi turned up, the, I had the, the right room. And um, this, so this was Friday, late afternoon, and um, I thought, right, I'll get on the air. I was um, able to set my station up. So as I said, I took a, an ICOM 7300, expert 1.3K, uh, login with wind test, uh, pass by there, key. So complete station set up. And uh, I thought, right, down to the beach. Need to get the, um, I, l I laid all the cable out. Um, need to get the, the pole up on the beach. However, I was greeted with um, 
the, the beach, um, although not out of bounds during the day, was out of bounds completely at night. Um, and indeed, a guy had been killed by um, a saltwater crocodile just a couple of months before arrival in Decem December 2017. Um, so it was quite serious stuff. And um, inst incidentally, the saltwater crocodiles um, weren't a feature of the Andama Andaman Islands before the tsunami. They arrived with the tsunami from, from somewhere, yeah. They must have been brought in. So um, I managed to lash, th there was a wall um, at, at the um, kind of between the resort and the beach. So I managed to lash up my pole on the hotel side of the wall and get my ground plane up and um, started. But the it was turning dark by this stage, and the SWR was sky high, and I thought, oh, just leave it till the morning. And then in the morning, I thought, well, if my um, pole is going to be, um, it was about eight, ten yards away from the sea um, in, in the hotel grounds, then I should look into um, suspending the antenna from the trees. So... Um, I'd taken a pulley and some rope, and, and actually this is a video, uh, which I hope works. The lad climbed the tree <laughs> and... <laughs> oh, got sound. <laughs> and he's tying the, the, the pulley. This tree is about 60 feet up, you'll see it in a minute. You see, there's, there's the spider pole that I'd used. So a uh, chap here was asking me about the Andaman, Andaman Islands um, previous. Loads of coconut trees. And in fact, the, um, the <laughs> there was three dangers. There was the um, sea crocodiles. There was the alligators on 40 meters. And then there was um, the falling coconuts were a huge danger. And in fact, that um, um, my little shack where my room was through the night, two or three times in the night, there'd be a huge crash as a coconut fell on the roof. And you, you had to avoid the trees as you walked around the resort because it was a real danger that the, these things could call, call, you know, land on your head. Um, the, um, how did he get up there, you might ask? Well, I, I did film him going up, but it wasn't very good. So I filmed him, filmed him again um, coming down. And he has a like um, a cloth strapped between his legs and his ankles, and um, he just shimmies up and down. That's the way to do it. So we all need a coconut tree in our back garden. I think that's the answer. Incidentally, um, I was the only um, Western person in the resort. In fact, I was the only Western person on the flight. And I did take time out while I was there to walk around and go and see the local village and walk on the beach and so on. And um, people would come up to me and ask for selfies because I, you know, I was a Westerner. They don't see very many. And um, some of them particularly were amazed by my blue eyes. Just hadn't seen it before. Or maybe only on TV. Um, so, the, the pulley was in the tree, um, I had my ground plane, and, and actually what that enabled me to do was, um, you can see here, I've suspended the um, ground plane um, up in the tree with the two elevated uh, radials. It was now dead easy to change bands. I just ran out, um, lowered the pulley, um, changed the, the, the jumpers on the three elements, the vertical and the two radials, and then I was back in my room again within a few minutes. So very, very easy. It was uh, not as close as I would have liked it to the sea, but uh, maybe 10, 12 meters, so not, not, not too bad. 
and it worked pretty well for a very lightweight um, antenna. I did take also a 80 meter dipole and some extra extensions to, to, to make it 160 as well. Um, and I'd, I had a couple of SCADs actually, I had a 160 SCAD with 5B4 AGM, um, but the noise on 80 and 160 was just horrendous, absolutely horrendous, and, and Bob couldn't hear me anyway. I did make some contacts with India and um, Kuwait on, on 160, DU2ET is it? Um, regular Philippines, DU7ET. Um, couldn't, uh, he could hear me, but I couldn't hear him. I think he only runs 100 watts. Um, incidentally, um, communication-wise, um, internet was very, very poor. While I was in Bangalore, I bought a SIM for my phone. Um, it did work in Andaman, but only um, at about three or four o'clock in the morning before everyone else got online. The, the internet is very, very poor in, in Andaman. Um, but I was getting up early before sunrise and it gave me an opportunity to check emails and um, WhatsApp um, kind of worked okay. Um, Facebook Messenger and Skype didn't work at all. Just It was just too slow, but WhatsApp was okay. Um, so I took the, um, I mean, one, once I arrived and got the antenna up, um, this was sort of Saturday evening, I suppose, and then I had the next um, seven or eight days to run pileups, which was, was great fun. Um, I took the ICOM 7300. Um, most of the operation was CW. Um, I've never used a pen adapter on the <coughs> expedition before, but this was um, this 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 here is my my pileup, and I saw this appear one day, and this was the um, the guys in um, um, they're in West Africa somewhere, Anabon Islands, um, who three s three C zero W was it? Who who appeared while I was there, and this was their pileup. Mine was bigger than theirs. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, um, but the having a pan adapter was really, really good, and um, that worked pretty well. Using the 7300, another feature was that um, you can put an SD card into it, and I recorded the whole de-expedition, which um, has been proved handy when you know checking QSLs and, and such like. But um, to be honest, although the 7300 is an absolutely fantastic radio, um, it found it difficult to handle these pileups. Um, the, the K3 is better at handling these kind of pileups, but I and you have to ride the RF gain a lot on on the 7300 as well. You do on the K3 a little bit, but it's even more much more so. So it was interesting to try it anyway. I did a little bit of um, data modes. You know the one I'm talking about. Um, that's the um, oh well, I didn't do fox and hounds. It it was only just coming out at this time, but that's an FT8 pileup you get a red screen. Um, all JAs in that instance. Um, so I'm starting to wrap up here. I've just got a few more slides left. My kind of daily routine, um, I'd get up bef before sunrise to take advantage of the gray line. Um, I managed to work 80 odd uh, US stations in total, which was really pleasing. Um, most of those were on long path. Um, all W6s, W7s, um, over the west coast. So um, when I was in Visalia in April, I was <laughs> popular, but um, there was much, you know, most of the US, I, I just wasn't heard, to be honest. And that wasn't um, surprising given that the palm trees that were there. So the typical day, I'd get up early, do the emails and, and stuff while the internet was working. Um, do that long path opening and then it would start opening up to JA and as the sun went across um, Asia and, and Europe then um, obviously the, the focus changed um, and towards my sunset I'd start going on 30 and 40. Pileups were enormous, I mean I tried to keep them wi within a few KC's but absolutely e enormous, great fun and um, I'm not sure whether it was the bands died or I died by um, <laughs> by about 19 or 20 local time. Um, but I, I went off to eat and generally fell asleep after that. <laughs> I, I had a few moans and probably quite rightly that the, the, the UK openings on uh, 30 and 40 was starting around this time. Yeah, sun, sunset in the, in the UK. 
and um, I probably could have worked more UK stations had I had the energy. But I really wanted to make the most of those um, long path openings to North America. So um, something you had to give. In terms of stats, um, I, was I was actually op operating for about seven and a half days in total because I took a bit of tourist time out and took me a while to get the antennas going and so on. So um, 7,735 QSOs in total, of which about 4,500 unique. Um, you can yeah. see um, per band only three contacts on 160, um, a bunch of JAs on 80, but only the loud ones because of my, no my, no my noise. Um, the bread and butter bands, well, 17 meters um, came, came good, 15 wasn't, wasn't bad either and spent, uh, spent quite a while on 30. Um, in terms of um, QSOs, um, 149 different England stations, 13 Scotland, 9 Ireland, uh, 9 Republic of Ireland, 2 Northern Ireland, 1 Guernsey, um, that was Bob, uh, and 1 Wales, and I think that was an FT8 actually. Um, QSL stats, and this was from a couple of months ago, last time I gave this presentation, so it's probably increased. Um, but that's the kind of figures. And in terms of um, continental divide, then um, obviously Europe was the bulk. Um, not surprisingly, because of that short path um, vista towards Europe, 87 with North America, which was quite pleasing. It could have been better. Uh, and then in terms of QSOs per day, then um, the best day was when the sun spots, uh, or when the sun was playing well. Um, there's there's 1,200 on this day. Um, there was a couple of days when conditions were really poor, and and that knocked the um, the QSO rate and my interest a little bit, to be honest. And um, yeah, just to reiterate, I was the first unaccompanied foreigner to operate since Jim Smith in 1949 from a VU4. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I think we've got one here. Chris. Um, I, I noticed that um, 20 meters uh, on the stats, 20 meters was down quite significantly against 17. Um, is that because you were having fun on 17 and kept going, or was 20 actually a bit down? Uh, generally, I st stuck to the highest working band the highest band that would work. Okay. Um, and um, I like 17. I um, mm. tend to get less kind of deliberate QRM as well. 40 was a um, big problem for de deliberate QRM, which is why I stuck more to 30. I, I concur. I, I like 17 because I worked during 17. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any more? Keith G three TTC. I mean, you took a um, a mast with you. Um, did you actually use it? What what height was it? So I took a twelve meter spider pole. Uh, I wanted to keep all options open, to be honest. So um, my original plan was to have that um, mast on the beach, suspending the ground plane. Um, and first night, I I put it up. Um, well, I couldn't put it on the beach because of the restrictions, because of the crocodiles. <laughs> Um, at first night I put it up and put the ground plane on it and the SWR was sky high and then once I got it onto, once I got the ground plane in up into the tree, I didn't use the mast at all, so it was dead weight, to be honest. The pulley's still in the tree, by the way, so if any, <laughs> the, the, the hotel were absolutely fantastic and, and said, look, if any of your radio friends want to come here again, you know, they're most welcome. Um, I, I said, do you want me to, uh, I asked, do you want me to take the pulley down? And he said, no, leave it there for any more of your friends who want to come and use it. So it's there. I don't know how easy it will be to get a license. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Any, any other questions from the, the floor? John, you, s you mentioned the, the police. Did they visit you in the... So ev every the, the beach um, was a popular beach uh, with local communities. People would travel there from distance, and there was a little police office um, about 10 minutes walk down the, down the beach. And, and every, every day, about three times a day, um, a couple of policemen, well, a policeman and a policewoman, would walk down the beach. 
And um, every time they, I, I kept thinking, I hope they don't see the antenna. I hope they don't, you know, which was hanging right next to the beach. And they were alma always so immersed in conversation together <laughs> that they never saw my antenna. <laughs> and um, actually, one day I went down the beach and just popped into the police hut and said, hi, you know, I'm a visitor, blah, blah, blah. I didn't say what I was doing, um, but he, he never mentioned anything about the strange wires at the hotel. Um, and no one came from the, the ministry or, or anywhere, so no visitors whatsoever. That's astonishing, really, as you were the... Uh the sole Westerner, I'd have thought that... But they, they didn't know that I was on my own because the, um, the license permit had three names on it. Of course, yeah. Um, and, and actually, Prasad s did say that although he wasn't flying in with me, he might come later. Yeah. Never did. No. <laughs> John, thank you very much indeed. I You're it welcome. It was a real tour de force, and, and you are to be congratulated on that. We, we look thank forward you. to your next uh, single operator <laughs> I'd rather go with a group. <laughs> North Korea, isn't it? Um. I wish. Thank you.